Heavenly Father, thank you for these ancient words. Will you come now by the power of your Holy Spirit? Open our hearts and minds that we might receive them. Will you lead us to the throne of grace that we might find help and mercy in our time of need. In Jesus, we ask this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. You please be seated. In the past couple of weeks, as I've watched the news and read all of the latest headlines, I've been reminded of something. Uh, that we, I believe, are living in a culture of great fear. A culture of great fear. Uh, maybe the truth is we always have been. Uh, but I think that with today's reality of information being always available at your fingertips, uh, in front of you at every possible turn, our sense of fear may be at an all-time high. Uh, because I think that we're all well aware of, of this fact, uh, or I think businesses are well aware of this fact. And in fact, I think that uh, they also are aware of the fact that fear sells. Uh, and it sells big time. And so they continue just to inundate us with more and more uh, information uh, that just seems to feed more and more our sense of fear uh, and anxiety. Uh, I think I first kind of experienced this myself, and maybe many of you did as well, after the, the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. I just remember, if you're like me, just being glued to the 24-hour news cycle. Uh, just not being able to get enough, just, to, just wanted to hear every little bit of, of information. Uh, but what, what was it that fueled that desire deep down inside, just to watch and just to not be able to turn away from it? I, see, I think there cer certainly was a sense of curiosity and just wanting to know what was going to happen uh, and wanting more and more of the latest information. But I believe underneath it all, uh, that longing for more information and that wanting to keep watching was a sense uh, of fear because suddenly things were unknown. Uh, suddenly the, the future was uncertain. What we thought we knew as being a normal, regular part of life, everything changed. Underneath it all of that is that sense uh, of uncertainty, uh, of an uncertain future. Now, I know for me the same thing happens uh, each year uh, as hurricane season comes and, you know, the first storm starts brewing in the tropics and then it starts making this way. Next thing you find yourself just watching all the time, wanting more and more uh, information. And, of course, there, that's a good thing to be prepared for it. Uh, but more than that, I think that underneath it all, at least for myself, I think I keep watching it because there's this sense of fear deep down within uh, suddenly the future seems uncertain and that fear of the unknown begins to creep in. And when fear takes control of our lives, it makes us incredibly self-centered people. Fear tends to make us act in ways that are selfish because uh, what happens in the midst of fear, we truly feel afraid for our lives as we act out of self-interest or out of self-preservation. Uh, Stephen King, the, the great horror writer and uh, science fiction guy, uh, if you've ever heard him talk on, on the subject, but it's actually quite insightful. Uh, he wrote this about fear. Fear makes us blind, and we, and we touch each fear with all the avid curiosity of self-interest. And, and then he goes on to explain why. Uh, what it is about fear that makes us so self-centered and makes us act out of self-interest. Uh, and, and this is what he said about it, particularly talking about in his field as he writes these horror stories. Uh, this is what he said, And the great appeal of horror fiction uh, through the ages is that it serves as a rehearsal for our own deaths. Wow. I think Stephen King hit it right on the head. Uh, at the bottom of fear itself, it, I believe, is the reality of death. Uh, if fear and worry always comes when our future well-being uh, is called into question, it's because deep down inside of us, in our subconscious, we know that death awaits all of us. And that we don't have power or control over it. So anything that reminds us of, uh, of this uncontrolled reality, it, it re results and creates in us a sense of fear and anxiety. You know, Chapman University every year does a survey on Americans' greatest fears. Uh, they've been doing it for a while, but in their latest survey that came out in 2018, they haven't released 2019 yet, 
Uh, here are the top 10 fears uh, that people reported uh, in, in America. Number one, uh, the fear of a corrupt government official. <laughs> number two, pollution of oceans, rivers, and lakes. Uh, number three, pollution of drinking water. Number four, not having enough money uh, for the future. Number five, people you love becoming seriously ill. Uh, number six, uh, people you love dying. Uh, number seven, fear of air pollution. Uh, number eight, there's a fear of the extinction of plant and animal species. Uh, number nine, there's a fear of global warming and climate change. Uh, and number 10, there's a fear of high medical bills. Now, you might say that some of these are silly, uh, and maybe they're just media driven, uh, and you quite possibly could be right on that. Uh, but media driven or not, all of them have the same thing in common at the very root of them. They all call into question the future and the uncertainty of that creates fear in our hearts. Because of the uncertainty of our future, well-being makes us consider the reality of our own mortality. That's what really is at the base of all fear. And that fear is so powerful that it can grip our hearts and minds and it can absolutely control us. Uh, the fear blinds us. And it fuels our desire to act out of our own self-preservation and our own self-interest. Yet, in our gospel reading this morning from Luke chapter 12, verse 32 through 40, uh, Jesus says to his followers, fear not. Fear not. And he goes on to give the reasons. Uh, and the reason is this. Life doesn't need to be uncertain. Our future can be absolutely secure. And when our lives and our futures are certain and they're secure, the result is we're free. We're free to live our lives in, in a good and right way with God and a good and right way towards one another. Because through Christ, we're freed from the blindness and the self-interest mentality that fear breathes and grows in our own hearts. And so with that, I want to invite you to open up your, uh, your bulletin to Luke chapter 12. Uh, verse 32 to 40, as we look together at the freedom uh, from fear that Jesus uh, is offering to us this morning in this gospel message. We're going to look uh, in particularly at verses 32 uh, through 34. But in verse 32, uh, Jesus said, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, right there from the get-go, Jesus gets to the point. Don't fear. We've already talked about the reality of fear, uh, that it's a result of the awareness that our, our future well-being is now uncertain and unsecured. Uh, you know, if you look at sociologists and psychologists, they'll tell you that fear is just a natural human instinct, right, for survival. Uh, it's how we've managed to stay alive and continue our species all these years. It's the thing that helps us avoid dangerous situations like, you know, it's probably not a good idea to go into that dark alley. Uh, or it's not a good idea to stick your finger into the light socket, right? The fear keeps us from doing that. Uh, and so in that sense, fear is a, a good thing. And there's certainly the fear of God, which the scriptures speak of, which is a good and healthy thing as well. But fear is also a bad thing. Uh, because it can make us act in ways that are selfish, out of self-preservation. It can absolutely blind us to the truth of what God's really at work doing in our lives and in the world. Uh, but either way, at the bottom of our fears is that reminder and awareness of our own mortality. You know, Jesus uh, then refers to his disciples after saying, fear not. He refers to them as little flock. Sounds kind of condescending, right? little flock, but what Jesus is communicating, he says, fear not, he's recognizing and acknowledging uh, that, that how fragile and vulnerable we are as human beings. We're vulnerable. We're fragile because we're mortal. We have, we have mortality facing us. And, and Jesus says, in the midst of that reality, fear not. Fear not. Because despite our fragile and our vulnerable state, we have absolutely nothing to be afraid of. That sounds strange. Why? Why? Because this is what Jesus says. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 
It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And in that one little verse, Jesus com completely neutralizes the core reason for all of our fears in the first place. How? Well, let's look at this statement just a little bit closer. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In other words, it pleases God. It's His desire. It's what He wants to do. He wants to give us and He longs to give us the kingdom. Uh, the word that is used here, it's the same word that God uses as He talks about His own Son, Jesus Christ, at His baptism. When He said, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. With that same pleasure that God has over His Son, so it is that same pleasure that God uh, is given, wants to give to us the kingdom. It pleases Him. It makes us happy just as His Son pleases Him. But why is this so revolutionary when it comes to neutering our, the very root of our own fears? Well, the answer to that question comes with, I think, a proper understanding of the kingdom of God in the first place. You know, I think this is really important because... Uh, I believe it's an area that we are greatly confused about, not only in the culture, but in uh, certainly in the church uh, specifically. You see, most of us think uh, in terms that heaven is being a place that awaits us when we die. It's this preferred future. Uh, that's the way we look at it, and, and that's certainly a good thing. Uh, but we also think of heaven as a state of kind of perfect existence, right? Uh, I, you know, that kind of idea of nirvana in some way, where you'll be happy forever, uh, which is also a good thing. Uh, but again, it's this view of just preferred future. It's this thing that, that, that's coming down the road. But what about here and what about now? How, how, how does that help us in any way, this preferred future, with our here and now fears and troubles when our future seems to be uncertain? How does the kingdom of God have any bearing on our present worries and anxieties? Well, when Jesus came at the beginning of his ministry, he declared this. The first words in Mark's gospel that he declares in his ministry is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand, which means uh, because with his incarnation, meaning by coming into this world as one of us, the very barrier between heaven and earth has been broken through. The barrier has been opened up. Jesus broke through. And with Him, He brought the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not simply some future event. The kingdom of God is here and now. Because it's not a place or a thing. It's not limited in any way by space and time. The kingdom exists everywhere and for all eternity. For it is everywhere where, God's, where God rules the hearts and minds of His people the realm where His grace and truth reign supreme, where His people enjoy His protection, His provision, His love. Do you know why fairy tales are so important? Uh, I know some might think it's, those are just for children, just childish things, but fairy tales are so important because they point us to the reality of the kingdom of God. That's what they're really pointing us to, where the good king truly loves his subjects fights for them, provides for them, and reigns with true justice and grace. No king on this earth has ever done it. But the kingdom of God, that's the kind of king we have. This isn't just some childish ideal. It's a picture of the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is telling us, that it is God's good pleasure to give us His kingdom. He wants us to have this. He wants us to have Him as king. It's a gift to us. And that kingdom, it begins here and now. And it's a kingdom that never ends. Not even death can stop it. Because of our entrance into God's kingdom is not something that we earn or we achieve. It's a gift of God given by His love and grace when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Through Jesus' death on the cross, our sins are forgiven. Through His resurrection from the dead, death itself has been destroyed. The physical vessels, these physical vessels will certainly one day fail us, but we'll continue to live with Christ forever. When we put our faith in Christ, the kingdom of God is ours here and now. You know what this means? When we're citizens of God's kingdom here and now through faith in Christ, we truly have nothing to fear. Because the reality is our future is secure. 
Uh, there is no uncertainty because the good King rules our lives. His love, His grace, His provision, His protection are ours. They're ours now and they will be forever. And the love of God in Christ, it casts all that fear away. As John recognized in 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. See, the punishment that John's speaking of is the punishment for our sins. It's death itself. Because of our sin and rebellion. Yet perfect love, meaning the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ on the cross, it brought us forgiveness and it brought us eternal life. When we have that kind of love in our hearts and minds, there is nothing to fear. And yet, we continue foolishly uh, to live in fear. Fear for our future health, fear for our future financial well-being, uh, fear for our lives, fear of what might be or might not be. But why? Well, I think that Jesus goes on to tell us uh, Jesus then says this, Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, I think we continue to struggle with fear because our hearts continue to treasure all the wrong things. In our heart of hearts, we still believe uh, in this that the whole idea of the fairy tale is just fiction. That it's not really true or it's too good to be true. Uh, we tend to just embrace the, the world's mentality and that is that God only helps those who, who help themselves, which is not a biblical idea. So we hold on to our money thinking that it's going to give us security and a future. Uh, we cling on to our health and, uh, and health care looking to them for our salvation. We put our trust in people and governments for our ultimate protection and well-being. And as we do all that, the fear just continues to grow. And the fear continues to take control, seizing our hearts. Because all of these things are uncertain. They cannot change the root cause of our fear. We hold on tightly to our possessions and our money because what happens is they end up becoming our gods. Fear becomes a result of misplaced trust. You know, we, we say something in our own hearts of this, like, I know, I know, I'm saved by Jesus, and one day I'll go to heaven, but until then, I'm on my own. i got to figure this out. i got to take care of myself. And the fear closes in, and we become blind to what truly matters most. And in the name of prudence and, and good sense, we hold tightly on to what we have but friends, the Apostle Paul in Galatians 5, 1, uh, he reminds us of this. It is for freedom that we have been set free. He then encourages us, stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. See, in Christ we're free. We're free from the bondage of sin. We're free from the bondage of death. And all the fears that, that, those, that those generate in our hearts. But when we look, to our money and our possessions is our very source of ultimate well-being, what happens is we become slaves once again. And yet in Christ, we are loved, we are cared for, and we're protected by God, our King. We're free, therefore, to give ourselves over to the kingdom and to all that God wants for us to do in this world. We're free to give generously because God is our provider. We're free to love the unlovable because God is the lover of our soul. We're free to care for those, the needs of others because God cares for our every need. You see, fear blinds us and it paralyzes us and makes us act out of self-interest. But faith in Christ brings freedom, freedom from sin, freedom from death, and freedom from all self-interest. In verse 34, Jesus said, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the question for us is, where is our heart? Where, are, where is our treasure? Is it found in what we have and what we don't have? If so, then our hearts will continue to be blinded to God and to His kingdom purposes. 
and fear will continue to hold us captive because uncertainty for our future well-being will continue to enslave us. But if our treasure truly is in the perfect love of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, that freedom is ours today and forevermore. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this freedom that you've given us, this good news of your gospel, that we do not have to be enslaved to, to sin and death any longer. And when we have been set free, we're free indeed by what you have accomplished for us on the cross. Through your death and resurrection, we have been free. Our future isn't uncertain. Our future is secure and certain in you. The kingdom is ours here and now and will be forever. Thank you for this gospel truth. Will you teach our hearts to believe this, that it's not some fictional fairy tale that's too good to be true, that it is the reality of this kingdom and that it's ours. We don't have to be controlled and hold on to what we have so tightly, thinking that it's going to guarantee our future well-being. For you have guaranteed that for us. So you come, Holy Spirit, Speak to our hearts. You let us know truly where our treasure lies. That we might be free to give freely of all for your kingdom work out of all that you have given to us. Jesus, we pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Will you please stand?